I hope, sometimes I preach about Bible characters and I hope you don't see yourself. Sometimes you preach about a Bible character and you're sitting there thinking, man, that's me up one side and down the other. I hope this is not you tonight. Because uh, uh, all these guys gave excuses why they couldn't serve God and do, get, serve the Lord and get right with God. And I'm going to preach tonight on three men who insulted God. Insult to God Almighty. I'm, my goodness, if you're gonna if you're gonna insult anybody, it ought not to be God. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about this evening. Start Luke chapter 14 and verse 16. You've heard this preached different ways, and I'm gonna use it this way tonight. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, he invited a bunch of people, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come. All things are now ready. And sent it, I'm sorry, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. It did not say they had an excuse. It said they made an excuse. See, nobody has an excuse. Right? People make excuses. You don't have one, you have to make one up. And it said the first said, I bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excuse. He bought some land. Another said in verse 19, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excuse. I got to go look at these oxen I bought. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. That's, they said, that's the only one that really had an excuse. He said, he he, the other one said, I got to go see this land. I got to go see this property. He said, man, I just got married. I can't. She'll kill me. And so he, he said, he cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. And the master of the house, being angry. Look at that. Being angry. Sent, said to his servant, go out quickly in the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded. And yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, look what he thought about them guys, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. He got mad. He said, You've insulted me by turning this down. Ain't none of you going to taste of this supper. I'm preaching on three men that insulted God is an insult to God when he invites you to come and all the blessings that he'll give you and you say, no thank you, I've got stuff to do. Uh, why, why is it an awful thing to insult God and turn him down? Well, because first, because of who he is. He's God. He's not just somebody down the road. He's not just a king. He's not just a prince of this world or somebody important, the governor, the president, a senator, a congressman, or a, even, a, even a famous preacher or something. And you say, boy, I, if they invited me, I'd make sure I went to their house. Listen, he's God. It's an insult to him because of who he is. It's not, secondly, it's an insult to him because of what he's done. Nobody else has done for you what he's done. Ain't nobody else you ever let his son die for you on the cross. What an insult to look at God and say, thanks, but no thanks. I appreciate you dying for me, but... I've got other plans. Think about what an insult that is to God. Think about it, young people. When you say, Lord, uh, I know you died for me on the cross and everything, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to do some other stuff. I'm going to play around over here a little bit. I'm going to go party. I'm going to go dance. I'm going to go uh, to the beach and have fun and my friends and everything. What an insult to God it is just to uh, brush him off like that and say no. And then it's third, it's an insult because of his, his great power. You know who's got the power of your life and death in his hand? God does. If I invited you to my house for a big supper, uh, you might say, oh, I don't want to come, Brother Danny. That might hurt my feelings a little bit, bit but I'd, just, I'd get over it. But you know what God has? He's got your breath in his hands. He decides when you live and when you die. He can pull the plug. You don't. You can exercise 10 hours a day and eat proper and eat stuff that tastes terrible and everything, trying to stay healthy, and you're still, he can pull the plug on you tonight. 
if he wants to. And ladies and gentlemen, it's an insult to him. Three things, and then we'll talk about these three men. First, he made a great supper. The Bible said he was the biggest and best. Uh, he said, uh, 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 you ain't going to have no bigger supper than this. I mean, it's like uh, the marriage supper, as we call this. And we're, they're doctrinally speaking, this will be people that are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Doctrinally, the bride is already there and married, ready to sit down and eat. He's going out inviting people during the tribulation, doctrinally. Practically preaching, I can preach this to anybody that he wants you to come and be a part of, of the Lord of, when he comes after his bride. So tonight, there's a great invitation. He sent forth his servant. Come, for all things are now ready. The spirit and the bride say come. The preachers say come. All the churches you see, all the preaching you hear, everything the Lord's saying, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. Every Sunday when we go to church, we give an invitation. We say, come to the Lord, come to the Lord. And Jesus himself said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Think about it, people. Think about uh, uh, the great invitation. Think about the great readiness. He said, come for all things is now ready. What is ready? What does he mean when he says everything's ready? Well, the Holy Ghost is ready. The Holy Ghost is ready. Don't you sit there and say, well, the Holy Ghost don't want me to. Yes, he does. It's blasphemy. I hear, pe I hear preachers out of ignorance get on the radio and, and they'll say, well, uh, the Holy Spirit ain't dealing with you. you ain't gonna... Listen, it, it's blasphemy to say the Holy Ghost wants you to wait to get saved at a later day. That's wicked. That's wicked. To say that God don't want... Somebody said, well, uh, God don't want nobody to say that. That's blasphemy. The Lord wants everybody in the world to get saved tonight. He's not, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Right? Get this junk out of your head of uh, it ain't my time. Your time is always ready. The Holy Ghost wants you. The Holy Ghost will deal with you. The Holy Ghost is ready for you to come. Not only that, the church is ready. Our church is ready for you tonight. There ain't a person in Burke County. There ain't a person in North Carolina. There's not a person in the United States that couldn't walk in that door tonight and come down here and say, God be merciful to me, a sinner, and this church wouldn't welcome you and pray with you. Down just a higher, brother. And ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, and the church is ready and willing for you to come. Not only that, the Word of God is ready for you. The Word of God said uh, He's ready to speak to you. The Word of God is speaking to you. The preacher, me, is ready for you to come. I'm willing to come. I'm willing to come. I'll stop right now. If you jump up, and I've had this happen, if you jump up and come run down here and say, what i got to do to be saved, I'm willing to close my, oh, bring my Bible down here and get down. I'm ready. Church is ready. God's ready. Holy Ghost is ready. Jesus is ready. That's, it's an insult. It's an absolute spit in the face of God to turn and walk out that door when the Lord's pulling on you and trying to get you to come. He said, come, for all things are now ready. Uh, uh, heaven is ready. Heaven right now is ready. People in heaven want you to be saved. You may not know this, but people in hell even want you to be saved. The rich man, when he's down there in hell, the Bible said, he's down there saying, send somebody to my house. Please let somebody go soul winning. Let somebody go knock on the door, Lord. Please. The, the people in hell want you to be saved. People in heaven want you to be saved. There's joy in the presence of the angels of God when one sinner repents. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great invitation and a great readiness. But three, three men insulted God. Number one, the first one said he insulted God because he had something to see. In verse 18, he said, I bought some property, and I want to go look at this property. He was all consumed about his property and his land and his buildings and his yard and his driveway and his garden and his all that. And I know we got to have that. Lord, I know people. Have you ever, have you ever seen these people that... Uh, have these beautiful yards, and every time you go by their house, they're out there working in that yard. I mean, there ain't nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, th I, I mowed my grass the other day, so it wouldn't be so bad when I got back from camp. And I think you ought to mow your grass, and I think there's nothing wrong with getting out there and playing. But um, you do know that you're going to die and leave that one day, right? You, you understand that? I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a nice house. I hope God blesses you with a big, beautiful house. Every one of you, more power to you, praise God, honor God, pay your tithes, do right. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But some people are absolutely obsessed with their stuff, 
with their stuff. And they get there. And you know what? You know what money will do? Money will buy you stuff. And you know what stuff does? It gets on your mind and it worries you and then you're grouchy and hateful and, and you, nobody can stand to be around you and you, you know, always stuff, stuff and you hire somebody to take care of that and you hire somebody else to take care of that, hire somebody else and first thing, you're about ready to blow your brains out because you ain't happy. Because uh, too much of that stuff, you got to worry about it all the time. Now I'm telling you, this fellow here, he, he, he had something to see. He had something to see. You know, I've traveled. I've got to travel a lot. The Lord has blessed me and in, in, in my ministry ever since I was 19 years old. I've been traveling, and I still travel. I'm, uh, uh, there was for several years there when I traveled almost every other week somewhere, and I traveled, and I've I've been in different places. And uh, you know, I, Mom always said that traveling is a good education, and uh, and so I got to, uh, the first time I went to Michigan. I think uh, I drove, me and two boys drove to Michigan the first time, and I'd never been to Michigan. I was 19, 20, I think I was 21, and me and these boys drove to Knoxville, up 75, and went through Detroit, on up to Flint, Michigan, and I preached. And I thought, wow, there's Detroit. And I went to Detroit. And then after that, I, I started preaching different places, and long story short, I've been my feet have walked down the streets of Los Angeles in Hollywood and seen them stars, and you know, them little stars. Them people kill themselves and die and go to hell to get their name on one of them stars and people walk and spit on them things when they walk up. Does them no good at all. I've walked in, in Hollywood. I've been to Las Vegas. Uh, uh, one time's enough for anybody. Amen. It's a, it, that place is a dump during the day and at night. Boo! It pops out, boy, like it's really something. It ain't nothing during the daytime. Oh, when all them lights off. I've been I've been over in in Canada and preached in the snow that deep uh, uh, in the church, but the snow was that deep. I mean, the kids was out in the in the parking lot turning flips in the snow like jumping in a pool. That's how deep the snow was. I've been up preached on the Indian reservation out in uh, in uh, Mississippi uh, uh, or in Missouri and and some of them places. And uh, I've been traveling all over Florida and Detroit and and New York City. I drove right through the middle of New York City, Washington D.C. Atlanta. Uh, I've been to Dallas, Texas, bunches, bunches of times. I've, I've, I've been seen the Grand Canyon, and you know, it started dawning on me. After I started going, I thought, you know what? Is this it? I remember thinking. I mean, I'm still thirty-something years old, and I thought, every exit has a Waffle House and a Holiday Inn, and they look just like it does here. There's a Steakhouse. There. Can I tell you something? You say, oh, I'd give anything to travel. Look. Have you, have you seen Mount Mitchell? Have you seen Lake James? Have you seen that's it. That pre, he preacher he bragged to me. He said, "No, you got to come to Montana and see these mountains. Our mountains are bigger than your mountains in North Carolina." I said, "Oh, they ain't done it." He said, "Yes, they are. Uh, they're they're twelve thousand feet up." And I said, "But ground level out there is six thousand. Right, that's right. In Denver, it's a mile high city, 6,000 feet flat on the ground. So their mountain's only 6,000 feet up, just like Mount Mitchell is here. Ain't nothing, and they ain't even got no trees. It's horrible looking. It looks like nuclear war has been fought out there. I mean, the first time I ever seen Texas, I thought, Lord, we've landed on the moon. Uh, this we went the wrong way. This is the blessed moon. I mean, there's no trees. I said, "Where's the trees?" Preacher said, "Ain't no trees grows here." He said, "If you see a tree, somebody planted there." I thought this is horrible looking. I tell you, listen. When it comes right down to it, it's hard to beat the Blue Ridge Mountains, y'all. It really is. I mean, they they ain't hardly no prettier place in this world. And even that, you just look at it. There's a tree. There's a rock. There's a waterfall. Wow. Whoop de doo. I I seen something really big. And you go home thinking, this is it? This is it? That's why Solomon said, all is vanity. All is vanity. He had everything in the world. Let me tell you something. Once you've had a good taste, what, you listen, once you've had a good taste of the things to come and the power of God, and it's got real to you, Things in this world, just, uh, they're second rate after that, brother. Disney World, the beach, New York City, I mean, Dollywood, I mean, it's okay, but some of that stuff, so some of it is okay, but I'm telling you, it's a far second uh, to the things of God. This man said, no, thank you, I'm going to go see my stuff, and insulted God. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, and I'm not saying this because I'm a preacher. You think, oh, he's just saying that because he's a preacher. There ain't nothing ever satisfied my soul like being in good Holy Ghost church services when the power of God's moving and people getting saved. It don't, it don't come no better than that. I've never been on drugs. I've never been drunk. But I've been around a lot of people I have and they don't act no happier than the people that I've seen bright with God. I'm telling you, when the fire of God's real and people's getting saved and the Lord's are moving in your heart and you know if you come back any minute, you'd go with Him. It don't get no better than that in this world, people. It don't get no better than that. It's just good to be saved, ain't it? It's just good to be saved and know the truth and know we got a better place to go. Thank God when we leave this world. He had something to see. The next one had something to do. He had something he wanted to do. Uh, cars, things, work on his farm, paint his house, uh, to cut trees, work, work, work. Nothing wrong with work. You ought to work. But you better remember, you better not turn the Lord down. You better not turn the Lord down. I seen a man the other day I'm going home mowing his grass on Sunday. I try not to judge him. Maybe that's the only day he had. Maybe he had been gone out of town. Maybe it's an emergency. I don't know. I try not to judge him. But I thought, Lord, have mercy. God gives us sick. I talked to people yesterday. They said, I work every Sunday. I can't come to church. I work. I thought, life is too short. Life is too short. To let something take up your time on weekend. Weekend. I know people have to work on weekends. I'm not being ugly. I don't mean to be ugly. But life's awful short. You better remember that. Life's awful short. A year's gone by. Another year's gone by. Another year's gone by. I'm telling you, you better get in camp. You better get in church. You better. He turned the Lord down because he had something to do. Hey, some people all the time want to do something. All they could find, we, we all could find things to do. I could say, I could say this, I can't go to camp this week because I got stuff in my house that needs work, and that would be the truth. That'd be the truth. I couldn't come to church this morning because I, I had things at the house, tore, and that would be the truth. But there comes a point where you got to say, hey, I'm going to put God first, honor Him, and let everything else just work out or not work out. Number three, and I'm done. One of them had something to enjoy. Verse 20, he got married, the pleasures of living uh, uh, with his, his new family, his wife. He had fun, and nothing wrong with fun in his place. Fun, races, ball games, enjoyment, stuff like that. But I'm telling you, brother, he spit in the face of God symbolically and insulted God by turning him down. Now watch this. October the 8th, 1871. Long time ago, the famous preacher D.L. Moody preached in Chicago. D.L. Moody, they said, robbed hell of a million souls. And brother, that he didn't even have an education. He'd say he ain't done that and ain't no word in it, and they thought he was terrible. And and he did it wasn't even ordained. And finally, after he was a great evangelist, they come and wanted to ordain him, and then he didn't want to fool with it. And told me that, or something like that, didn't need it. And D.L. Moody, D.L. Moody, they said he robbed hell of a million souls, and he'd get up and preach, and he'd preach and preach, and the night of that night in October 1871, October the 8th, D.L. Moody preached, What shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? And he, back then, a lot of preachers didn't give invitations every service like, like preachers do now. A lot of them didn't. They thought, we'll give the Holy Ghost time to work on people a while. And I'm not saying that's, uh, that's always bad, or, uh, 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 but, but that's the way they did it. And before Ira Sankey, his famous song leader, that stayed with him all them years, they were a team, Moody and Sankey, just like Billy Graham used to have... Uh, that guy led singing for him all them years. What's his name? George Belichie, Cliff Barrow, some of them guys. And, and Sankey Moody, Sankey Moody, Sankey Moody. And, and old Sankey got up to lead the song to sing, and they had to cut the, the service short. D.L. Moody got up and said, I'm going to give you a chance to think about it. Come back next Sunday night and make your decision for Christ. And before they got out, everybody listen. They heard fire trucks coming down the streets of Chicago. And that night was the Chicago Fire. If you've never seen a documentary or read about, heard about the Chicago Fire, the whole city almost burned down. 
They said somebody's cow knocked over a, a, a lantern or something with kerosene in it, caught into a barn, went down, and almost destroyed the whole city of Chicago. People died. People, they screamed and hollered all night. And D.L. Moody said, I'll never preach again without giving people an invitation to come. He said, every time I preach from now on, I'll give people a chance to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me this evening, people? Don't just sit here and think, this is another Sunday night. Don't just sit here and think, oh, well, this is, I mean, oh, oh, Danny's all right tonight. This ain't really a great sermon, but I, it's okay. Don't think that. This might be last chance. The Lord's given you to come. You've been fooling around with sin. and You've been messing around doing something you ain't supposed to. This could be your chance. Don't insult God and sit there. If you're a teenager here tonight and you're not right with God, get it right. You say, oh, I got camp all week, preacher. I'm going to wait till about Thursday. Sin a little while first. You may not have Thursday. You may not have Wednesday. You may not have Tuesday or even Monday. They insulted God. Saying no. I don't want to insult him. I have before. The Lord's dealt with me before, and I told him no, and I'm ashamed of it. But I don't ever want to do that again, ever. Some of you have been backslid so long, you're comfortable in your backslidden condition. And the Lord's speaking to you tonight, saying, You need to come. They'll come and get us a song, and we're going to give you an invitation. This ain't me giving this invitation. It's the Holy Spirit through his word. I'm just a man. It's him. It ain't me you're turning down. It's him. Let's stand. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Nobody's moving. Nobody's talking. Heads bowed.